Okay, our next one is from Matthias in Stockholm, Sweden. I was recently approached by an atheist on Numbers 3117. That really is a nasty piece of scripture. It makes some sense from a divine counsel worldview, but it's still hard to chew. <laughs> How would you explain the command to kill all except the virgins that they got to keep? This atheist wanted to infer that it was for sex slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he quotes, uh, what was it, Numbers 3117. Um, now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones, kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls, this is verse 18. Who have not known man by lying with them, keep alive for yourselves. So that's, again, Numbers 31, 17, and 18. Now, again, this was as far as the male children, which he's not really directly asking about. I mean, that was a very common you know, practice, again, to you know, cut off a dynastic line, cut off a, you know, an armed opposition in, in the years to come and whatnot. Again, that, very common in the ancient Near East. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's harsh, but again, it's part of the culture. It's part of, you know, what you do. Uh, every woman who has had, you know, sexual relations, you know, with a man, this was, they were particularly singled out typically, again, not just in the Bible, but generally, because they were, you know, the, the whole saying to Solomon about, you know, the your, if you multiply wives, they'll turn your heart away from, you know, this, that, or the other thing, the Lord, or basically, you know, what you should be doing. I mean, that, that can apply, you know, and, and it does apply in, in other cultures. But with in terms of the Israelite stuff, it has a very specific religious connotation uh, in terms of idolatry. You know, since the, the people in question in Numbers 31, in, in the context, uh, they're dealing with, a, you know, particular, particular peoples in particular places that were tied to, again, idolatrous practices. And so the assumption that would be made, and apparently was made, is that women, again, who had been sexually active, yeah, they, they might have been like sort of just married, but there was a sexual component to a lot of the religious rites of the day. And so the Israelites would have viewed any woman who was not a virgin with suspicion that she could have be either been lost her virginity or been active in a you know sexual activity that was part of an idolatrous relationship to another god and so those women were often again excluded from marriable candidacy because of the fear of you know idolatry bringing bringing idolatry into the camp and so that would have been the rationale behind their elimination which leaves in verse 18 those who had not had sexual intercourse with a man. Now that the questions that the atheist guy, you know, gave our, our questioner, you know, about sex slavery, that there's no sex slavery in this in this passage. If you were a virgin, you were you were marriable. And if you were married by an Israelite man, then you you became a member of the Israelite camp, which means you were entitled to the rights and the protections of the Israelite society. I mean, it it doesn't it doesn't necessitate a a select save like sex trafficking situation. So that's an assumption that is brought to the passage by that particular questioner that you know who you know was was questioning the Matthias. So I, I think it's a mischaracterization uh, on that level. I mean, it's it's obviously harsh, but you know I, I would take this back that when you when you see these 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 familiar practices, when you see these these cultural practices, especially if they are associated with uh, idolatry specifically. I think on the one hand, you know, here, here we are with you know, the Moabites here. On the one hand, you could say there is some logic to the fact that, well, this is, this is what we do in conquest in our patriarchal Semitic culture. This is how we do things. And there are lots of other things, again, that are, that are familiar to and related to, really part of, uh, that world, the world of the biblical person, the world of the biblical writer at the time, and and they just sort of on one level are what they are. In other words, God doesn't come to Moses or any other biblical author and say, hey, I'd love to use you to write something down, but you need to change your culture first. You need to rid your, your culture of this particular element that is offensive or someone living later might, might you know, consider offensive or the Gentiles, you know, who are going to read this stuff later might consider offensive or whatever. You need to change your culture first and then, then we can work together. Okay. God never does that. And a lot of this stuff that winds up in scripture, especially in legislation, okay, especially legal kind of things. Uh, and, and again, these are, 
this is part of it. You have, you have legality, you have conquest, you have warfare, again, the rules of war and all that sort of stuff. That, again, on one level, that just sort of is what it is. And and God doesn't say, hey, nobody else does this, but we're going to institute this thing where we go into a city and then you get to kill people. I mean, it, it, it's not foreign at all. On the other hand, on the other side, there is, again, a, a, a quote-unquote theological rationale to this because of the issue with idolatry. Uh, if if you you know if you did have a situation, especially with the women, uh, and there are elsewhere in in the travels of the Israelites, where and, and archaeologically speaking too, we might as well throw that in that there were associations, you know, sexual practices by certain people in certain places that were directly linked to idolatry. Then, you know, this is something you don't even want to mess with, and so you eliminate you know this this part of you know, of, of the refugee, you know, population, that sort of thing. So it it has a rationale. It's, it's distasteful to us. And I think, you know, for good reasons, because it's, it's, it's very harsh. I mean, it's, it's life or death, you know, kind of situation. I like, I, I look at, at something like this and think, Hey, I'm glad that the theocracy was planned to be obsolescent from the beginning. And that usually startles some people, but that is true. Okay, the theocracy and these laws that go with it and the culture that goes with it, the patriarchy that goes with it was designed from the beginning to be obsolete. It was designed to go away. How do we know that? Well, we know that because of the Abrahamic covenant, because when God, again, disinherits the nations and he starts Israel with Abraham, he makes the covenant with Abraham and says, through you, all of the nations will be blessed. And we know what the meaning is behind that that they're going to be brought back into relationship with the true God. And we know in salvation history, you know, how God had planned for this to work out. You know, we need, you know, to fulfill the covenants, God has to become a man. And that's, you know, going to, going to happen later. It's not going to happen now, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that there was sort of built into the flow of salvation history, the plan of God to bring all things full circle, the non-necessity of the theocracy. And because it would include all these other things, you know, Gentiles and whatnot. So there's planned obsolescence built into this, which makes sense because God doesn't inspire a particular culture. The people who he uses have a particular culture and some elements of it we can look at and say, that's just terrible. And, and again, I think rightly so. But God doesn't didn't inspire a particular culture that was a necessity to carrying out the plan of salvation. He just worked with people where they were, who they were at the time that he decided to do so, and then planned to phase out certain things that would eventually eliminate you know, these, these other sorts of things. That's just the way it was. So that might not be a comfortable you know, answer, but that is, again, the picture that emerges when you look at the whole, kind of the whole system of salvation history as a whole, uh, in a, as an entirety. It's not married to a culture, which ought to tell you from the get-go that biblical theology is not necessarily dependent on or endorsing of a particular cultural practice. You get these harsh rules. They're designed to insulate Yahweh's people from other gods. And part of the, part of the way you, you would do that you know, is to, again, have this, this kind of thing happen. So, again, it's, it, it, it's harsh. It's distasteful. But it's not something that God looked at and said, yeah, we need to keep doing that. That needs to be a big part of the gospel, you know, killing off our enemies, you know, that kind of thing. That, that just wasn't the case at all. In the, in the plan to bring the enemies to a relationship with him, we don't need this. But it is the way it is at this moment in time. 